So this past two days in Rwanda, I visited some of the scenes of some of the worst atrocities of genocide. But today, up here in the hills, which I'm climbing up at the minute, that's why I'm a bit out of breath, I've visited some of the rural communities where reconciliation and forgiveness is taking place amongst perpetrators and survivors of the genocide. And I have to say, I wish everyone from Northern Ireland could come here and hear the stories of the people here. I think if they did, we would take down our walls overnight. The opening clip was recorded last month in Rwanda by Tony McCauley. Tony, welcome to the studio. Can you tell me a little bit about that visit? Well, last year I had the, the privilege of meeting uh, an inspiring leader of a reconciliation project from Rwanda. He was actually visiting Northern Ireland as part of a programme called the Inspiring Leaders Programme. And uh, while he was here, he was meeting with various people from here who've been involved in peace building and reconciliation over the years. And the idea of the programme was to connect us up so that you know, he could learn about what's happening in Northern Ireland and we could learn about what has been happening in Rwanda. So I have to say, I, had a, I, I met this guy, Christopher Coffey, uh, one day and uh, we clicked immediately. Uh, we were on the same wavelength about uh, what we believe was important and what we were passionate about around reconciliation in a post-conflict society. So as a result of that, um, one of the things I do in my work is I do executive coaching. So I offered to, to do some voluntary coaching of Christoph once a month um, via Skype. Uh, really to support this inspiring leader and the work that he, the amazing work that he's doing in Rwanda. And the result of that, I got to know him and, and uh, he invited me to go to Rwanda to, to hear about the work of reconciliation that's been happening there uh, since the, the genocide in 1994. Can you give us a brief background history to the Rwandan conflict? Well, in 1994, there was a genocide, and, uh, and it was a genocide uh, of the, the, the Tutsi people uh, by the Hutu people. It was horrific. There were a million people were killed in 100 days in 1994. The scale of it is unimag unimaginable, uh, the horror of what, of what happened. And... Um, and of course, a lot of this goes back into history because the Tutus and the Hootsies, they're not really a different tribe. That was kind of, that kind of was de developed and the whole idea of carrying identity cards of your ethnic identity was kind of developed by the colonialists from Belgium. So, you know, that, that's kind of the root of where some of this came from. But anyway, it, 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 it all broke out into this kind of genocide, this genocide in 1994. And... Really since then, the country has been through a process of reconciliation. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the perpetrators of the genocide, uh, you know, who confessed to their crimes, went to prison. Um, uh, many of them were released then in the early 2000s, partly because there were so many and it was overwhelming the prison system. And, and as a result of that, the... Um, the perpetrators ended up going back to the towns and villages and streets where they had committed these horrific crimes against their neighbours. And often they had been friends and neighbours for many years. So what you've ended up with is that you've ended up with people who, have, who were perpetrators and people who are survivors basically living beside each other, seeing each other every day in the same, in the same community trying to work out how are we going to live together, um, knowing what, you know, what he did to my family or what I did to her family. In the video, you say that if we knew the Rwanda experience, we would take down our walls overnight. What do you mean by that? In Rwanda, I had never, I'd never seen such, um, I suppose, evil in terms of what had happened. I'd never, I saw the worst of what human beings can do to each other. So I went to the main genocide memorial site in Kigali, and it's, it's a mass grave for 250,000 people. And, uh, you know, men, women and children. And it tells the story in detail of the, the horrific murder of, of all, all of those people. And then I went to some of the smaller towns and villages, and I visited other smaller genocide memorial sites. 
I remember standing in a church which still had, had been preserved. It had bullet holes in the, in the ceiling. The clothes of the people, the thousands of people who had been slaughtered there were still there. There were still coffins and skulls and bones in, 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 on this site. And I remember standing feeling completely numb um, that what had happened was, although churches would maybe be perceived as a place of shelter in that context, they had actually were deliberately used as a place of rounding people up to kill people en masse. Um, so, you know, so I saw and heard the worst and most horrific stories of how people were killed, men, women and children. And the stories of how the children were killed were the, were the most heartbreaking of all. Um, so that was the one extreme. But then I discovered the other extreme. And the other extreme was um, Christoph took me to a, a village in the hills and I met together with a group of uh, about, about 40 people from the village, a mixture of Hutus and Tutsis, a mixture of perpetrators and survivors. And I heard about the reconciliation process that they have been through. And um, ordinary people, mostly kind of middle-aged people, they're 40 plus, that sort of age group. And uh, they'd been through workshops around forgiveness and reconciliation and they got into little cell groups and they started to tell their stories to one another. They started to listen to each other's stories. And ultimately what they ended up doing was becoming reconciled. And so we had pairs of people got up and spoke, a perpetrator and a survivor, and told how they had been reconciled to one another. And so, for example, one woman stood up and she told how this man who was standing beside her had been friends and neighbours with her husband since they were wee boys. And at the start of the genocide, he came and he killed her husband and he killed her children, her, her male children as well. And so she told that horrific story of what he had done to her family. And then, and, he, he, and she talked about how she has, through this process, forgiven this man. And then he talked about what he had done and it was equally as powerful. He talked about, he took full responsibility. He didn't blame, the, you know, the politicians or the context or anything like that. He took full responsibility for the, the suffering that he had caused to this woman and her family. And, and talked about he had gone to jail and when he'd come out, he, he, he had gotten involved in this process and, and he had confessed and asked her for forgiveness. And I had never heard the like of it. I mean, I've, done, I've been involved in reconciliation work in Northern Ireland over the years, and some, there are some stories, quite powerful stories here, where people have been reconciled, you know, you know in terms of that, to that extreme. But, but it's quite rare here. Um, so the contrast between, and I heard more stories like that, other pairs get up and told similar stories. So the level of reconciliation after such horror was way beyond anything that we have we have done in terms of reconciliation in Northern Ireland. And the interesting thing was they asked me about here and they asked me about, did we have reconciliation processes like this? And I explained to them about Northern Ireland and, they, and then they asked about the walls, the peace walls that uh, sep still separate communities in Northern Ireland. And they were kind of horrified. Um, and, you know, so I had gone to Africa to hear what they have been doing. And the last thing they said to me before I left that village was, was that they would pray for Northern Ireland, that we would learn to have the sort of reconciliation that they have so that we could learn to live without our walls. That wasn't what I was expecting to hear. Why do you think it is that we haven't progressed as much in terms of reconciliation in Northern Ireland? I think we have complicated reconciliation. It's not complicated, you know, confession and forgiveness and love. I mean, they actually talked about, I asked them what drives you to do this? Because this is incredible for me to listen to. And they said, it's, it, it, we're driven we, by love and we want to live at peace with each other for the rest of our lives. And I suppose maybe we don't have enough of that. And, and so we have complicated reconciliation. We put conditions on reconciliation. We've politicised reconciliation here. 
Um, and also we, have, we, we believe you have to throw money at reconciliation. You need millions of pounds from the European Union to, to, you know, to support a peace and reconciliation process. They, th that little village that, that um, I heard those remarkable stories in, um, what that project cost was a pittance compared to the millions of pounds that have been spent on peace and reconciliation in Northern Ireland for a much smaller result compared to what's been happening in Rwanda. Do you think that the peace and reconciliation funding from Europe, do you think it was misdirected or had a different priority or was, uh, could have been used more strategically? I think it, it's, it, it's, it has been a really important resource because you know, the, the local government here has not resourced peace and reconciliation. Most of the peace and reconciliation funding has come from America or Europe. So without it, there would have been even less peace and reconciliation work uh, happening because it's not a political priority really for our politicians. Um, so I think that's, that, so, so it's good that it was there, but I think we have found very creative, complicated ways of actually not doing it. You know, um, you know, so I mean, I've been very involved in peace building over the years. And, you know, we, we, we talk about the importance of single identity work and single identity work in peace and reconciliation is the idea is you work and understand your own community, your own culture, your own history. And that gives you a confidence then to engage with the other and understand and have a dialogue with them. And like for me, that's really important. But I think that in our peace process has been twisted as a way of kind of, well, we'll do single identity work forever because the community's not ready yet. And, you know, in, in some places I, I can ask the question, when will the community ever be ready to move beyond single identity work? And how long are we going to keep funding single identity work, you know, led by people who really don't want reconciliation? In this next clip, you show the remains of uh, a church that was bulldozed with people seeking sanctuary inside it. Well, this is one of the most uh, disturbing genocide memorial sites I've been to yet in Rwanda. This is the site where 3,000 people were gathered in a church for safety and shelter from the genocide. and. Unbelievably, what happened here was the priest ordered a bulldozer to bulldoze the church with the people inside. Behind me is all that remains of the church. And today, they have built a, a memorial and a, a mass grave for all the people who died in this area. So there are something like 7,000 people buried here. At every level, that was one, one of the most horrific things that I had heard. You know, the, not just the, the sheer uh, bloody horror of it, but the, 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 the betrayal and the mistrust. Um, and, uh, you know, the, you know the, the, the using religion and turning a church into something so evil. Uh, to me, that was one of, one of the most stunning stories that I heard in the whole time that, that I was there. And do you know what I find really remarkable was that behind the genocide memorial building where, where the old church had stood, there was this brand new, much bigger church that had been rebuilt by the parish. So I found it really interesting that in spite of what had happened there, the church was still alive and well and on that, on that site. And it was really interesting because there were good and bad examples uh, so on the one hand, I remember one of the other churches I went to, there was a memorial to a Catholic sister who had been like a hero and she had spoken out against the genocide and she'd spoken, in, spoken out against the militia and she had been murdered. She basically was a martyr, basically uh, for peace. And then on the other hand, in one of the genocide memorial museums, it, there, were, there, were, there were photographs and the stories about some other Catholic sisters who had been... Um, tried for genocide because they had colluded with the militia in killing people in their local community. The contrast was incredible. In this clip, Christoph also describes the church atrocity and what could be described as the acts of heroism. Young people in this school, this they were attacked. Here? Yes, they were attacked. They were attacked by rebels 
And when the rebels got in, they asked them to separate themselves, to divide themselves between Hutu and Tutsi. And so they asked them to separate uh, yes. the, the young people, who is Hutu and who and is Tutsi. Tutsi, and they were going to kill the, the, the Tutsi. Tutsi. Yeah. And the students, they refused to divide themselves. They said, we are all Rwandans. Right. And they, the rebels, three times asking them in different classrooms because during the night, yes. the students refused and they were shot all together. They died all together as one person, as, wow. as, as Rwandans, instead of being divided. And this is a clear a sign. We see on one side of the hill, a leader, mm. a shepherd who failed, yeah. to, failed. Take, yeah. to, fail to take his responsibility. Yeah. And three years later, we see young people who actually became the leaders. Uh, the young people gave they the lived, leadership. They lived out the leadership because yeah. they said we are one. And they, they, they were ready to die and they, some of them died. Yes. We see some of, some of the images down at the, the memorial. So, yes. And it's, it's, it's two opposite hills. Yeah. So it, it, it shows the story that leaders can fail. Yeah. Those who are in the leadership position. But actually, leadership is not about position. It's yeah. about the heart and the mind and the understanding. Yeah. And this is a, a beautiful yeah. statue to the, to the memory of those young people. Recently, the Pope apologised for the Church's role in Rwanda genocide. Do you think the Churches here could learn from that Rwandan experience? In one sense, the churches here did not descend into to that level of, um, you know, to that level. But on the other hand, and, and you know, I, I come from a faith perspective, so I'm not, I, I'm not, you know, I, I don't want to bash the churches just for the sake of it. But I feel in our context here, both during the Troubles and, you know, since the end of the Troubles, during the process of reconciliation, the churches have tended to be more comfortable looking after their own. So during the troubles, they they cared for their own side. They 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 buried the, they buried the, the people who had died. They comforted their own, and they kind of supported and sometimes represented the political views of their own side. That that's and and I think the church here, both Protestant and Catholic, is quite conservative in in that sense. Um, and for me, again, you know, throughout the, the the history of the troubles here, there were heroic figures. You know, certain clergy who played a really important role in our peace process, often in the background and unsung. And to me, they were the minority. They're kind of unsung heroes of mine, in a way. Um, uh, but they, within their churches, they were tolerated. Sometimes they weren't tolerated by their congregations. Sometimes, the, and, and they were seen as a bit maverick. Um, they certainly weren't mainstream. So in our context here, although we never descended in, into that level of um, the, the, the churches actually becoming involved in the violence to any great, you know, great degree, we, we, we didn't see the churches here, to, and, and I've, I've yet to see the churches here take a lead on reconciliation. I mean, I think it's fascinating that what I was listening to in Rwanda was about forgiveness. And forgiveness is a very Christian concept. It's at the heart of what the Christian gospel is all about. And in our peace process here, we hear very little talk about forgiveness. There were glimmers here and there, you know, with like Gordon Wilson. But, you know, we, don't, we, we, didn't, we haven't heard a strong, consistent message from the Christian churches here about forgiveness. And, and I think that's, that, that's one of the reasons that we, we haven't got the sort of reconciliation here that they're developing in Rwanda. That's part of the reason we're stuck because people here don't want, we don't really want to forgive each other. And, uh, and, and there's no real um, leadership in our society, either political or religious, that is kind of helping us and supporting us to really make peace with one another and forgive each other for the past. There seems to be an awareness that people in Rwanda are trying to come to terms with their difficult past. In this case, planning to build a peace centre. Yeah, so Christoph, this is the site for the Rwanda Peace and Reconciliation Centre. Could you just explain the layout of where the centre will be? Yeah, thanks. Uh, as you can see, it's, it's kind of the land, it's on the hill. So we are planning to have two different entrances. Yes. The one entrance, the first entrance will be down here, the hill. Yes. Because we are standing right now, it would be more 
the conference center. Yes. Uh, and and then as you walk a bit up in the middle, we have the, the the library and the museum and the coffee shop. Yes. And then as you walk up a bit up the top of the hill, we have the accommodation. Yes. And that's that's where we have another entrance coming coming up from the yes. from the other side. So we, we are planning to have two different entrances. Yes. To facilitate their access. Yes. To the to the center. But also kind of to separate people we'll be staying at the accommodation yes if the people are coming we will be coming to visit yes the, the museum and the, the the conference center and and the, yes. the youth library so that's there's, there's no um uh, kind of uh, confusion yeah but also uh, as you see we have access to to the main road yes so it would be very easy for anyone to access even mm -hmm. some people might stop by by uh, driving by because there'll be a coffee shop there'll be, oh, yeah. there'll be so even yes. people who did not intend to visit but yes. because it would be nice so people could come and they stop call in. call in and stop yes. and you know maybe use bathroom and have coffee or whatever yeah. but also um, we have the nice view from this this other side like looking Beautiful. looking yeah. the other side with mountains yes. yeah. and as you can see we are a bit we are a bit out of Kigali yes the city close to people so yes. that people feel they are part of this because we we need we need ownership from the local people. Yes, and, and Carsa has been working in this location. And and, and Carsa has been working in this, this location for the last uh, seven years. Yes, we've uh -huh. been we built a relationship with the local people here, with the local government here. Yes. So we want to make this center really a center for the people. Yes. Uh, so that people uh, uh, feel the ownership of yes. it. That's why we we thought it's good to bring it here. Yes. Where it's easy for the local people, the rural people to actually get access to it, but also allowing genocide survivors and perpetrators from this area and, and other areas nearby who really want to share their story as a legacy yes. to yes. come and, and be recorded, yes. uh, captured their story from the center yes. and keep them here. So that's, that's, that's why we thought about having this place. So we've got local, local people who are genocide survivors and perpetrators will come here, share their stories of reconciliation, and then there may be people staying from different parts of the world in the accommodation up here who will come to learn from the experience of Rwanda. Exactly, that's the whole purpose of this center basically is to uh, provide the Rwandan experience mm. from the Rwandan people, local people, mm -hmm. sharing the experiences with, with the rest of the world. Yeah. So that's why we thought also having an accommodation there. Yes. So that some people can come just for learning and they can stay here on the site mm -hmm. to be able to interact mm -hmm. with the local people. Yeah. Uh, so, but secondly, I think um, at this place will be also a place for learning mm. because we have those stories captured and, and kept uh, audio and videos. Uh, then people can also come for studies or research yes. because we're also intending to have a space for for um, community research, mm -hmm. where we we bridge researchers and community members, yeah. and all that will be happening here, so that yes. people can work from the center, do research, meet people, learn from their reconciliation process in Rwanda, mm -hmm. but also staying here, yeah. which a bit you know uh, give them the opportunity to really interact with with the rural area people yes. and 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 the site itself, like like the community itself. So it's a bit of of a bridge between Rwandan journey of forgiveness and reconciliation, bring that out and connect us with the rest of the world. This peace centre that, that I'm involved with, Christophe, in developing, uh, the idea of it is to record the stories of reconciliation. Something about the African culture and spirit that to me is at the heart of this, and I think they have something to share with the rest of us that, we could, that really needs to be uh, recorded and um, shared with the rest of the world. The stories are really powerful. In Uganda, you're involved in youth projects with young people learning new digital skills. Tell us about that and how you got involved. A couple of years ago, um, a group uh, of men who were involved in supporting the, the, uh, the development of a school in Rwanda through the Fields of Life charity here in Northern Ireland, they asked me if I would come and do a charity book reading one night. It was St. Patrick's day as far as I can, St. Patrick's night. And so they, they, were, they were having this event in Portadown and they asked me if I would come along and do a book reading as part of the kind of entertainment of the night to raise money for the, the project. So I, I went along and we had a great night, but I also heard a little bit about the project and the work they were doing in Uganda. 
And a few weeks after that, they contacted me, the leader of the team contacted me, and um, he, he, he asked, um, will you come with us next year? Will you be part of the team? And you know, will you, will you come and write, a, you know, use your skills as a writer and, and tell the story, meet people, write, write, share their stories? So, so I, I said yes, and uh, so, I, so I went to Uganda with that team, and while, while they were working on the school and the project, um, I got to meet local people uh, in different places, and I interviewed them and heard about their lives and their stories. And again, I met some really inspiring people. I expected going to Uganda because it's one of the poorest countries in the world. It would be like one of those comic relief videos that you know you'd be, I'd be in tears and really upset. I didn't feel that way at all. I felt really inspired and happy when I heard the stories that people were telling me. And the, and the one that stood out for me was uh, we went to visit the, one of the biggest slums in Kampala, and I met some young people there who grew up in that slum, who, who lived on the streets, and they had become le leaders in their own community. And they were developing um, support for other children and young people um, in their own community for themselves. When all hope was lost, my friend came to me and told me about the Elevate program. I didn't want to go because I thought that there's nothing good that will come out of my life anymore. But she persuaded me and encouraged me. And we went to Era 92 Media to enroll for the Elevate program. Luckily enough, I was accepted and started to train as a web developer. After my four month course, I was given a job and that was one of the happiest moments of my life. I remember going back home to inform my dad that I'm going to start working and he was very surprised. I soon discovered I had the ability to create and build a whole new world of possibilities in every website I design. The joy that comes with creating something new the page layouts, the code, everything that comes, it's like I create my own world. I see a whole new world. I see a world where there's no sadness, where there's no toiling, where there's no suffering. A world of happiness, a world of beauty, a world full of color and design. What I cherish the most is the opportunity to share my earnings with my dad and my sister. This is something I wish for all the youths out there, that they can get an opportunity that I also got, that they will also be able to build a life outside poverty, outside unemployment, outside corruption, outside prostitution, outside drugs. That with elevated program, they will be able to also achieve their dream. I have developed a kind of working partnership with with this uh, with this sort of this group of young people who they, they have a charity aspect of what they do. They have a, a local uh, sort of social enterprise of what they do, as you say, using you know digital technology, digital skills to sort of uh, develop and support young people from this from the this slum in Kampala to give them an opportunity, to give them hope, to give them training, to give them an opportunity for jobs and a, and a future, a better future for, for their lives. So again, I'm, I'm supporting uh, the, uh, Trinity, the leader of that project, by Skype through coaching. They redesigned my website. And li uh, later this year, um, I'm going to uh, record an audiobook of my second book, Bread Boy. Paper Boy's already out as an audiobook. And I've decided that um, I'm going to go to Kampala and uh, Era 92 are going to uh, produce and publish my audiobook. Tony, thank you very much for visiting us in the studio and good luck with the rest of your work. Thank you, it's been a pleasure.